This is Megapine. Megapine. M I P. With Masamela Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Megapine. Get woke. Nice buns. Soft, fluffy, and ultra low net carbs. Discover Hero Bread, the delicious ultra low net carb bread with incredible taste and texture. Hero Bread has zero grams of sugar and is under 100 calories per serving. Plus, high in fiber with 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving. Available on Amazon.com, Walmart.com, and at Hero.co. That's H-E-R-O dot C-O. Delicious, ultra-low net carb Hero Bread buns and tortillas. Soft and fluffy, high in fiber, and with zero grams of sugar. Up to 10 grams of protein, coming in at under 100 calories. Order today at Hero.co and use the code AH10 to get 10% off your first purchase. That's AH10 at Hero.co. H-E-R-O dot C-O. Order from Hero.co now and get 10% off your first purchase with promo code AH10. That's 10% off with code AH10. H-E-R-O dot C-O. Time for another edition of your favorite segment, folks. Thursday Coast with the founder of the Daily Coast, the largest online progressive community, the founder of Civics with a Q, and the host of the ever-popular podcast, getting more popular by the day, The Brief. Marcos joins us during this holiday season. Hey, buddy, how are you? Doing good. It's the uh, our last one of the year, I think. It is. Yeah. It is our last one of the year. And I, I will have you know, I just returned to New York uh, from... Tuesday, well, one of, they have, there's so many people that are invited to the White House holiday party it has to spread out over a week. So I went to Tuesday nights, took my son to the White House. He got to meet President Biden. Uh, and, and he was, he was cool with that. So many people. And like I said, it's spread out. They have like a whole week worth of parties because you can't get everybody in there in one night. And I was talking to people about how, why so many people still come. And what that's about. And obviously it's because for four years, nobody went to the White House holiday party. Right. Can't imagine why. Right. <laughs> why, why wouldn't we go? Why wouldn't anybody go? No one went for four years. Nobody wanted to go. I think it was one year. Melania had a decor, had a decorated like the Adams family or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> like, it, I was, last night, I was imagining seeing that. And I was like, Ooh, why wouldn't anybody want to come in here? Oh my God, that's horrible. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, fun, festive occasion, everything. So had a good time. Uh, and so starting on that point, um, uh, it's not been a bad year, uh, for Joe Biden, has it? No. And, and before we talk about Joe Biden, uh, I did not get an invitation to Joe Biden, but I did go, I, I used to get invited during the Obama years and I okay. finally went one year and you're right. They, they spread it out. There's like 10 of them. And they, they kind of have themes. So, you know, I think they have one for like congr Congress people and then one for like media and then one for, and I assume it's going to be the same thing. Um, they had Barack Obama and Michelle sit in a room, take, there's a line all organized. And it's just like a, it's a machine. You get in your picture with the president and the first lady. And they had to sit there for what, like four hours a day for like 10 days straight, taking picture after picture, after picture, after picture. And, um, I, you know, the, the stamina required for that is, is, is extensive. And I assume the, uh, Biden did the same thing, right? They did the same thing and that's work. But the difference now though is, and this is what is a little annoying. You don't get individual pictures anymore. So oh. if, they'll put like 12 people together. Okay. And, you know, so you're taking pictures of people you don't even know. Got so, it. <laughs> you know, it's, right. so it's not as, it's not as cool as it once was, but um, but yeah, that's the difference now. And I, that's y'all. That's you know, I know people think that people in the White House don't work or presidents don't really have real jobs, but I'm gonna tell you. Imagine as Marcos is saying, taking pictures with you know thousands of people in a line in a receiving line. That's no, I don't know how many of us would want to do that either. So. Just, just keep that in mind. So anyway, Joe Biden had a, it, you know, 2022 started up looking pretty rough and, and given the prognostications and the conventional wisdom, it had the potential of being a really bad year. 
uh, had things panned out, but but we staved off the threat to democracy for another two years. Doesn't mean the threat is gone. Doesn't mean we've fixed it, but we've staved it off for another two years. And uh, we, uh, Joe Biden got got student debt relief passed, and yet the Supreme Court's going to take a look at it. But at this point, Mark, the Supreme Court strikes it down. I, I think it's just just another nail in the coffin of that Supreme Court. It's just adding to the ammunition that we need. Uh, and the court is now a political issue. And I think some of these justices are finally starting to realize that, that they, the Republicans on the board, on the court, realize that they cost their party the election. I think they may be treading more carefully. And they're treading, it was clear they were treading more carefully on this, on this, um, this case that they heard last week on the the sovereign state legislatures, where supposedly they can they can do whatever they want on elections, and uh, even Justice Kavanaugh, who was a avid proponent of the theory a decade ago, seems skeptical in 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 um, oral argument. So the court may back off, but anyway, Joe Biden did did push that through the student debt relief. He got through. Um, the uh build back better he got through the um the um the infrastructure bill he had the most successful midterm election of an incumbent president in 88 years i mean the 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 numbers are are just dramatic a party in power in the white house had not gained seats in the senate and gained seats in governorships in 88 years Biden accomplished that. And Mark, we, you know, you and me, we, we, we're, we'll be critical where we need to be and we'll push where we need to push. And I think there were some strategic decisions that were made that helped us this year that may backfire on us in 2024. And we could talk about that. But all in all, Biden had a fantastic year. And, and I think in lots of ways, he may be quieting a lot of the, the chatter about replacing him on the ballot. For 2024, because that, whenever you think about Joe Biden, if you want Democrats to win the White House in 2024, Joe Biden is our best bet to win it because incumbents just have massive advantages in any presidential election, which is why they almost never lose and why Donald Trump almost won re-election despite being incredibly unpopular. Uh, well, well, let's talk about some of the things you think that may come back to matters. All right, so the big one is Joe Biden's decision to differentiate between MAGA Republican and the Republican Party. I, I think it's, they're all the same thing, right? The Republican Party is completely beholden to Donald Trump and his brand of politics. And even if Donald Trump gets replaced by Ron DeSantis, it's still MAGA Republicanism. It, it's this hateful, you know, pseudo-populist, own the liberals type of, you know, intellectually discurious, uncurious, uh, no platform. I mean, that's sort of the modern Republican Party. It's how do you trigger liberals? And the distinction between sort of MAGA Republicans and regular Republicans helped us defeat those MAGA Republicans in key races in battleground states. But if you go down the line, the Trump-endorsed Republicans did dramatically worse electorally than more rank and file establishment Republicans. And it helped us because Donald Trump and his influence made sure that a lot of his people got elected. But let's, let's take uh, Arizona, for example, where you look at the statewide elected offices, um, attorney general, secretary of state, governor, were all mega Republicans. The superintendent of schools candidate Republican was not, was not a Trump endorsed candidate. She was a more traditional Republican. She won. The other three lost. So by creating this distinction, it may have helped, and it probably did, help us raise awareness of those trump back candidates and help us defeat them. And I don't want to, I don't think it's, I think it's impossible to overstate just how important that was because we won every contested governor race in all the battleground states except for Nevada. And the governor in Nevada doesn't have control of the electoral machinery. And we want all the secretary of state offices in all the battleground states, except for Georgia. And at least in Georgia, we know that the Republican Raffenberger is not going to steal the election for, for the Republicans because he had a chance in 2020 and he didn't. 
So it was, it was, um, it was a good approach, I think, in helping us keep control of the house. Definitely helped us in Senate races in Georgia, in, in, uh, Arizona and helped us hold some of our tough seats, like in Nevada. But what happens in 2024 when more establishment Republican win more primaries? There, there's a definite push from the Republican establishment against MAGA Republicans. Uh, there's, there's, it's, 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 uh, not all powerful, we know, because Ronda McDaniels is going to win re-election as hit, head of the Republican Party, even though she's been presiding over three losing elections in a row. But since she's you know Trump aligned, she's getting re-elected to head the Republican Party. But there's going to be a stronger push. There's going to be more money for Republican candidates that are not on that Trump wing of the party. And we have done a good job, and Biden did a good job of branding MAGA itself but not the broader Republican Party in the dangers that they are. Because say what you will, they're still incredibly dangerous, no matter whether it's Donald Trump or whether it's Ron DeSantis or whether it's, I don't know, what's, what's, <laughs> what's the leftover normal Republican? I, I don't even know. Um, Mike Pompeo, I don't know. None it, of it, it, yeah, it, they're all, they're all awful. So the distinction gives, gives, um, gives Republicans the chance to, if they manage to push off to shed a lot of the MAGA baggage, it allows them a really easy chance to rebrand and Biden's given them an opportunity. But I'm not saying this to sort of criticize, it, we won, we won. It just creates an environment moving forward that may present new problems and we'll address those as we get there. But I would love to see the, Repub the Democratic Party broaden that cr criticism of the Republicans into, um, into, um, the broader Republican Party. And I think a lot of it was was designed to peel away those suburban Republican voters that are like teetering on the edge. And if you say all Republicans are bad and they've been Republicans, you know, it's maybe not the best way to bring them along. So there was a point, you know, suburban uh, Republican voters around Atlanta, they voted for, they voted for uh, the Republican governor. They, Repu they voted Republican all the way down that ticket except for Herschel Walker, because he was a MAGA Republican, right? So it helps us because, because Warnock didn't win by that much, right? That was not, it was, it was a close election. So it helped us, but it didn't help us overall with, uh, with a chance to, to win the governorship in, in Georgia, not to mention, you know, the um, other races like Secretary of State, Attorney General, et cetera. Um, so no, no, that's, that, that's, uh, important. But lastly, we touched on cinema, I, any new thoughts about her and, and her behavior and, and what we can anticipate from her in 2023, is she going to try to just block everything? We, you know, we, before, I don't, I don't think she had changed parties before, you know, last time we talked, I think we were she, just talking about, yeah, she was hinting at it, but I, she had not officially done it yet though. Yeah, right. So we had talked about how she would have to, in order to, if she thought she was going to win re-election, she would have to tack to the left and be more amenable. While Joe Manchin, if he runs for re-election, would have to be more um, obstructionist because he has to build his credibility with, with West Virginia, which is a very heavily red Republican state. Right. Well, it turns out that, that Cinema decided she doesn't, want, she doesn't want to bother trying to win a, a primary election. She knew she didn't have a chance. Instead of polling, she's got a 6% approval rating amongst Democrats. So she was never going to win it. So what she's doing is she's playing chicken with the, Repu the Democratic Party. She's saying, all right, I'm an independent now, but I'm still going to caucus with y'all. If you run a candidate against me, you risk, you, you risk throwing this over to the Republicans. Here's the problem, Mark. Cinema has a 6% approval rating with Democrats. She's not a Democrat anymore. And it don't matter what she does, if she caucuses with Democrats, whatever. Democratic voters in, in Arizona don't care. Here's the thing. She's got an 8% approval rating with Republicans and like a 14% approval rating with independents. Nobody likes her. So in a very, very close election with her running as an independent, there's no doubt that she would come in third place. The question is, would, who would she take more votes from? And right now, 
she's given Democrats no reason to want to vote for her. She's given Republicans more of a reason. And from approval ratings, they're about, they're about even. I suspect that she would literally become a non-factor. And that's even assuming she can get on the ballot because she needs to get like 400,000 signatures, but she ain't going to have the party apparatus gathering those signatures for her. She's going to have to have volunteers. Who's going to volunteer for her? She's got no volunteers. In fact, this whole week, I've been seeing stories about former former people who volunteered for her who are pissed off and, and burnt and feeling betrayed. And who's gonna, who, who's like got the passion to go out and raise, get 400 signatures for, for uh, Christian cinema? They're nobody. So she's going to have to pay for it. So that's going to cost money. It's going to cost a lot of money. Now, who's going to sign those petitions? If I have to guess Republicans. And maybe Republicans will throw some money at it as well to, to, to make it happen. But ultimately, the idea of her playing spoiler is predicated on the idea that there are Democrats who will still vote for her. And I don't think there are any of them. And looking at civics polling, when she's at 6% approval rating, which is about the same as Republicans, um, I don't see that. And this is even before People realize that she's, you know, she's left the party and we have a better, we, uh, Ruben Gallego is our candidate and he's, he's running as a strong Democrat. And this idea of playing chicken with the Democratic Party, it's also really stupid because the Democratic Party can't keep a candidate off the ballot. It's not like they can say we're going to clear the field for her. It would have to be a decision by the top candidate. So we've cleared the ballot for, uh, in Maine, we cleared a ballot for uh, for um, Angus King, but that's not saying nobody can run as a Democrat. There's been there's Democrats on the ballot because anybody can can get the signatures and do the filing fee. It's just that the Democratic Party is not going to be pushing the Democrat. And all the top Democrats in the state are like, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to run. So um, what this does in Arizona, obviously, Ruben Gallego is going to he don't care, right? He's he's going to run, and. He's not dependent on the party because he's going to raise more money than, than God. Right? He's going to raise all the money. I mean, the guy who's running at Kirsten said like, he's going to be the most popular Democrat running in 2024. So the party can't keep him from raising money. They can't keep him from filing the fees. They can't. It, none of that is possible. So um, it's a stupid bet for her to make. I suspect what's going to happen. And, and this is the end of 2022. We'll see how this prediction shakes out. In uh, in about eighteen months, I suspect she's she's she, she may dip her toes into trying to raise the uh, get signatures, realize it's too freaking hard, and then decide she uh, she wants she's not going to run for re-election. That's my guess. Really, really, okay. Well, I hope you're right about that because we don't need her to be a spoiler. But you make a good point. Uh, all Arizonans would have to do, Democrats, is not vote for her. Uh, in in a general, if she's trying to be a spoiler, and I, and they obviously if they don't if only six percent support her now, they're not going to support her then. Um, it, since last we talked, you've gotten more, um, in, in you've had more commentary on Elon Musk and what he's up to, and I, I noticed a tweet earlier where you you basically compare him directly with Donald Trump. I uh, it. You know, he, he used to be a darling of the left when his whole shtick was about clean energy and, and saving the earth. And, uh, and it, it was good, right? I mean, I drive a Tesla and I love the car and I love that I'm, you know, it's, it's powered by my solar panels and it, it feels good to have carbon neutral transportation, blah, 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 not to be smug or, or <laughs> about it. What he's done now is, it's kind of fascinating because, um, he has COVID broke him. The COVID lockdowns broke him. He he could not fathom his factories being shut down so people wouldn't freaking die of COVID. And and that um he fell into the whole fire Fossey, you know, Fossey, uh, Fossey and 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 that sort of deplorable right. And he sort of spiraled in that in the, into that world and now he's deep into retweeting just the, the worst of the worst, including white supremacists and neo-Nazis. I mean, it's, it's, he's deep in that world and all right, great. Like, you know, good for him. He, he can say what he wants. Problem is that he runs a public company, Tesla, 
whose clientele is wealthy, progressive liberals. I mean, you can't, you, New York City's full of Teslas. San Francisco, like every third car is a Tesla. I live in Berkeley, you know, half my block are Teslas. LA, Teslas. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Teslas. You go to Republican land, there ain't no Teslas out there. In fact, they're the ones that are roll cold. They're the ones that are being extra polluting because they think it's hilarious. They're the ones that trash on Prius and electric cars. This entire election, Mandela Barnes in, in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin was attacked for supporting uh, tax breaks for electric vehicles. There was this whole ads that were attacking him because he supported in, uh, incentivizing people to buy electric vehicles. Here's a whole hate act. Marjorie Taylor Greene said that, that it was effeminate to drive an electric vehicle. I mean, never mind that, you know, my Tesla could kick any of their cars, you know, <laughs> on a track. I said, hey, if we're going to get like what makes a car great, it's, it's speed, acceleration, great. Electric cars crush it. But some of how must, because he, he sort of fallen into that, that narcissistic trap that Donald Trump is in, that he gravitates towards those people that idolize him. For Musk, it's crypto bros and, you know, and, and incel, white, male, loser, white, right, you know, right people, you know, right wing people. And for Donald Trump, it was, it was, it was a deplorables. I mean, there's a world, Mark, because, you know, Donald Trump doesn't have any ideology. Like, there's, he, he stands for nothing but himself. There's a world where had liberals been praising him, he'd be a liberal. He'd be a Democrat. In fact, there is talk about him running as a Democrat at one point. Because he, he has no, no sense of uh, ideology. And Elon Musk, I think, is that way. It's, it's who's praising him. So it was great when liberals were praising him because of clean cars, clean energy. And now it's, it's the wrong people. And, and so he's fallen deep into, into that track. But what it's doing is that it's really destroying the Tesla brand. I will never, ever, ever buy another Tesla, uh, unless he's gone, you, you know, there's a world, but as long as Elon Musk is anywhere near adjacent, even him making money from it, like, no, there's, there's no way. And I see it with my, with my circle of friends out, you know, here and, and, you know, we're, we're, Barry, a very progressive professional networks. You know, they're, they're fairly, they have money, they have resources. I don't dabble in billionaires, but Teslas are not billionaire cars. There are people who, you know, it's, it's that upper middle class world that, that can buy a fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 car. And, and hey, nobody's going to be caught dead because buying a Tesla now is sort of the, it's, it's the transportation equivalent of wearing a red MAGA hat. And suddenly, Tesla stock is down 60%. It's the worst performing Fortune 500 stock in the, in the stock market. It's down 60%. It's, it's cratering, even though from its fundamentals are doing, it's doing decently. They're selling cars. They're doing okay. But the brand, um, the brand is, has taken a massive hit. The market has taken a massive hit. I got a couple of calls over the last month asking me if I wanted to upgrade my car. Never had that before. It used to be that there was a year long, year long um waiting list to buy a, to buy a car once you ordered it, it was it was 12 16 months before it delivered now they're calling me asking me if i want if i want to upgrade this this month it's the end of the quarter so i'm assuming that they're not they're having trouble meeting their targets and it's because people like me won't, won't touch it i have lots of friends who are in that world where they're uh starting to think okay i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna my car's old now I'm going to buy an electric car. And Tesla used to be number one in that conversation. And now they're not even, they're not players. Yeah. And there's plenty of competition. And so why? It, it's, it's not like it's the only game in town anymore. And so uh, Elon Musk, is, he's taken his, his Tesla brand. SpaceX is dependent on govern, government, uh, government contracts. It literally 100% or 99% of its, of its revenue comes from government contracts. He's pissing off a democratic administration. I mean, he tried to put his fingers on it, tried to get people to vote Republican, didn't work. Boring company, his, his tunnel company, 
It's all about creating tunnels under cities. Who runs cities? Democrats, liberals, right? So you're burning that. The, uh, what other companies? Yeah. Like, when you look through his companies, he is re- like none of them, absolutely none of them are companies that cater to right wing conservative, um, buyers. And so he's burning, he's burning his entire market of all his companies. And why? That's, that's why. For, for what, for what purpose and what end? Cause it's not, it's not getting him anything. It's not making anything better for him. So yeah. That, uh, and, oh, and Twitter itself, he's alienating the advertisers that, that make up Twitter. And so he's trying to do his Twitter blue thing for eight bucks a month that people are going to describe like. Only the biggest, I mean, it's becoming, it's getting to the point now where if you have a, a blue symbol and you pay for it, you're, like, you're a joke. Like people make fun of you. It's it's not considered a, a but you have people, who, they got to make the richest man in the world, the richest man, although know, he's not the richest man in the world as of yesterday, but got to make the richest man in the world get his money back. Twitter, he bought Twitter for $44 billion. Of that, 13 was, was, um, was financed. So he put in, $31 billion. Now, $3 billion of the loans are short-term g- loans, and they're up. And so the banks are negotiating with him to translate those to more. To They have to be backed by Elon Musk himself. So he's going to have to put up $3, million, $3 billion additional in Tesla stock as collateral for those loans. That puts his investment at $34 billion. Irrational assessment of the value of Tesla, uh, of, of, um, of um, Twitter, is it's probably worth around $10 billion. And that was before he lost half of the advertisers. So we don't know what the revenue is, and there's little chance that Musk will say what the revenue is because he doesn't have to. It's not a public company anymore. But let's say he's lost half his revenue. He's lost half his advertisers. Let's just, he's probably sitting at about a $5 billion company. He's not making that investment back. So, but he's hell-bent on turning it into, I don't know what, Gab or Parler or any of those right-wing social media sites and, and, and alienating and chasing away um, large parts of that audience. And so, but he doesn't understand it. Like he never ran a business that, that depended on advertising. And ironically, he, runs, he, he used to be very mocking of companies that needed to advertise. He thought advertising was the dumbest thing in the world. Tesla has never advertised. SpaceX has never advertised. Why do you buy a company that depends on advertising if you have no idea what that means? And a lot of that, honestly, is kissing up to ad agencies. It's, it's, they, they, you, you're not going to, you think, ah, oh, Elon Musk, I'm so, you know, famous and popular and give me money. No, that's how this shit works. You got to actually, you got to, you got to whine and dine and, and give people a reason to want to give you their money. And he doesn't know how to play that game. So he's, he's, uh, every one of his businesses right now is, is, uh, well, SpaceX, not yet, but definitely Twitter and, and Tesla are seriously sucking wind right now. And I don't see how he gets out of that without him literally just walking away. Just, all right, you know what? I, I fucked up. I'm going to, here's, I'm going to either sell it or I'm just going to hand it over to a CEO, but with real power and real safeguards saying that I'm not going to meddle. I don't know what that would even look like, but there's, there's, there's a world where the best he can do for his own financial success is to literally like walk away and stop trying to, to run it because he's not as smart as he thinks he is. And that's what this whole affair has really shown us is that. He got a, he got lucky. He um, he surrounded himself with some real talent, but at this point, he has so burnt his brand that his ability to attract that talent is going to be uh, particularly challenging. And he makes really dumb decisions. Like this assumption that Musk knows what he's doing because he's been successful has been blown out of the water. And I think that may be the biggest damage he's done to him. Like even bigger damage than losing. Forty billion dollars on the deal. Yeah, you probably. I'm, I'm sure he's going to have to end up selling. Um, uh, lastly, um, it's the end of the year. You've been covering um, Ukraine a great deal for all of us. Um, what's the latest as as we head into this holiday season? What's what's going on now, and and where do things stand? So uh, we haven't talked about Ukraine in a while, and probably the whole fall because we were talking about the election. We were we were prioritizing, but uh, I've been covering Ukraine almost daily. 
in that entire time. And since we, through, through the fall, since September, Ukraine has retaken about 25,000 square kilometers of, of territory. So we're talking massive, massive amounts of, uh, of territory. That's why about 12, 14, about 14,000 square miles of, of territory. Um, Russia isn't moving forward anywhere. Really what they're doing at this point is they're just digging trenches, defensive positions. They're trying to hold on desperately to what is left, what they've, what they've captured so far. Uh, on the other hand, what they're doing is they're launching Iranian drones and ballistic missiles into Ukraine's energy and, um, and, uh, um, heat infrastructure. So, the Soviet states, what they did is, is it wasn't like here, you know, like we have where we have our own like heaters, right? We have our own central heating or we have radiators. What they do in, in the Soviet states, including Ukraine, it's like a New York City apartment where you have a boiler in the basement and it sends heat up to all the units in the building. And they don't really control on and off, right? It's the building controls heat on and off. That's how Ukraine is, but the entire country. That's how Russia is. So if you hit a hydrothermal facility in Ukraine, then you knock out heat for a big chunk of, um, of people. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it as miserable as possible to freeze out people and have them live in the dark. It's, it's, it's terrorism. It's literally terrorism. They cannot win on the battlefield. So they're trying to break Ukraine's spirit. Obviously, we've seen this time and time again in history. When you do that, you actually harden people's resolve to fight like nobody breaks because the electricity is out and they're cold people know how to wear jackets and it's just it's this ukraine like this is a part of the world that's used to bitterly cold winters and they didn't always have electricity so that's where things are there's a stalemate there is a um, big part of the stalemate though because you know like i said ukraine has taken twenty five thousand square kilometers back in the last three months They've stopped because they, um, there's a phenomenon in, in, uh, in, in that area region, Germany too, because I, I lived it when I was in the army. Rains and some, it springs and falls, it rains and everything turns to mud. And basically the countryside is just one big stupid swamp. It's, it's gross. And so this is why Russia's attack in February, March stalled because once the ground thawed, in March and April, literally their tanks would get swallowed up in, uh, in mud pits. And so now it's the reverse, you know, it helped Ukraine out in March and April. Now it's hindering in the fall because everything is, is soupy and they can't move. And that way you can only move on roads. And if you move on roads, it's easy to ambush and it's easy for artillery to have those coordinates. So they're waiting for the ground to freeze. So we fully expect Ukraine to launch the offensives in January, February, when the ground is nice and hard and Ukraine can maneuver in the countryside as opposed to being limited to, to roads. So the, the bottom line is that Ukraine is still basically has the, they have the initiative. Russia is desperately trying to cling on defensively and they're trying to, to raise the lines and calling for, for negotiations because if they pound Ukrainian civilian infrastructure hard enough, they hope that Ukraine then cries uncle says, all right, let's negotiate. And Russia gets to keep the territory they have now. Ukraine's not interested. I'm not going to happen. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see that happening. Marcos has been a great year with you. Once again, as always, we've been doing this for quite some time and another year in the books with Thursday Coast. We'll resume again at the beginning of the year. Happy holidays to you and the kids, your entire family, buddy. Okay. Yeah. And happy holidays to you, your, your family and all your listeners and everybody who follows you and appreciates what you do. Uh, it, it was a good year. It didn't look that way. And we've had a bunch of really crappy years. And I think we have, a, we have earned the right to really be happy with how things have turned out and, uh, and sort of gather our energy. Cause Mark, thanks sir. We're going to have some important elections next year. In April, we have a Supreme court election in Wisconsin that may very well have 2024 ramifications. So we're going to have to be ramped up then. And, uh, and the 2024 cycle is starting up. So we have tough maps in the Senate. We want to retake the house. 
we have a lot of organizing work to do. And so now is a good time to, to be happy with what we've done, be satisfied for the moment, rest, relax, enjoy family, uh, take stock of everything that, that, that um, all the privileges that we have, and then get ready to pick up the fight again next year because uh, the other side isn't resting and we can't either. No, our enemies don't rest. We can't afford to either. Thanks again, Marcos. All right. Love ya. Love you too, man. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. As always, perform an act of kindness on behalf of an elder or young person. Write a letter to a sister brother who just so happens to find her or himself incarcerated. Offer libations to the ancestors upon whose sturdy shoulders we all now stand. And above all, give thanks to the God of your understanding by whatever name you call her and him. All God asks of us is that we give each other love. Thanks for giving MIP love. And please remember to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.